So uh, I'm going to cover a couple areas. One would be uh, uh, what I call the aerial environment. That is from the from the uh, soil lineup, basically uh, the light, the temperature, humidity, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, 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 gas exchange across the leaf. Those type of things that are in the uh, uh, above ground part of the uh, plant that the plant perceives and is responding to. And then I'll talk a little bit about the root environment, uh, water and nutritional uh, management. So, uh, uh, I'm, uh, Rose asked me to concentrate on tomatoes, so that's what I'll do today. Uh, but there's a number of crops you can grow in a greenhouse in a vine type uh, situation. Uh, if you go to Europe, they grow everything from eggplant to to peppers and and uh, melons and cucumbers, et cetera. Uh, but we'll talk mainly about uh, tomatoes uh, today. And uh, I'm going to start out by just covering some of the trends that uh, we see across uh, across the world uh, in greenhouse over the last couple of decades uh, that uh, are uh, affecting uh, crop productivity, our ability to manage the environment. Uh, uh, some of these uh, have to do with structural designs and some of the technologies that we have uh, nowadays. Um, so overall, we've been seeing steady increases in yield, and we're just getting better at managing this crop. Uh, we have better technology, and that all filters into uh, these increased yields. Um, we have improved environmental control. I think our knowledge of how to control the environment uh, is, uh, is probably uh, uh, better now. Uh, we see increased use of things like LED lights. Uh, we've used high pressure sodiums uh, uh, on greenhouse tomatoes uh, uh, for a number of years now, but LEDs give us some exciting new uh, possibilities uh, to, especially in low light uh, uh, climates. Uh, the use of grafted rootstock, uh, probably heard about that already, but uh, for disease resistance, increased vigor, uh, have uh, greatly increased uh, uh, yield capacity. And then uh, we see some uh, improvements in structures and production systems and some really early stage uh, uh, technologies that are under development that touch upon better space utilization. So a number of uh, things that have taken place over, over time that have, uh, have uh, been able to affect uh, yields. So one of the uh, uh, things we see if you go around the world is uh, uh, bigger structures, uh, taller structures. Uh, I have a couple pictures on the screen. One is a, a lettuce crop in Belgium. You know, it's 20 foot to the gutter. This is a low profile crop growing at, on a single plane in the greenhouse. Obviously, you don't need the headroom. The purpose for these bigger, taller structures are uh, they're using natural ventilation. Uh, and uh, you get better environmental control, better light distribution across uh, the crop. Uh, so that ability to control the environment uh, better is, is the justification for doing that. So you'll see structures that are 20 foot to the gutter, 24 foot to the gutter, even though the crop may, even a vine crop may only get uh, part way up that. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a cucumber house uh, those plants are only getting eight to 12 foot high in that house, but you can see the, the gutter height is much higher. And the purpose again is, is just environmental control. Okay, we know a lot more about management of the crop and this is a real balance and uh, game uh, with tomatoes. Uh, we can do things that push it towards more vegetative growth or we can uh, uh, manage to get uh, it more generative. If we don't have control over those that balance water, nutrition, uh, temperature, these type of things, uh, we can either get crops that are too vegetative and are producing very uh, low amount of fruit or poor quality fruit, uh, or we can go too generative where the plants load up, then the vegetative uh, development uh, punks out, and uh, we're left trying to uh, trying to uh, a manage around these kind of ebb and flow of yield. So our knowledge of how to manage these 
these uh, various uh, uh, factors has uh, greatly improved. And those are some of the things I'll, I'll talk about today. Okay, uh, I mentioned improved lighting systems. Uh, a lot of LEDs are being used. Uh, they come in uh, as in a center uh, picture. They can be single point source, much like a high pressure sodium lamp uh, uh, mounted overhead at, you know, in a grid type pattern, provide a fairly uniform light uh, over the top of the crop. Uh, or uh, one of the big advantages would be these these LED light bars that can be placed right inside the, the vertical uh, crop canopy. What that does is it gives you the ability to boost the photosynthetic capacity of that, of that crop uh, in, the, in the direct vicinity of those developing fruit. So the leaves that surround the developing cluster are the primary leaves that feed that cluster. So the photosynthates uh, from those leaves are drawn directly into those fruit. And uh, if we can boost the capacity of those leaves, we can get bigger fruit, uh, uh, greater yields. And so that's something we cannot do with something like a high pressure sodium lamp, where we have a tremendous heat um, uh, that comes off, off of those. You have to maintain a distance with the crop. The LEDs can be mounted right inside. On the right-hand side of the screen, there's a picture where there's a double row uh, of, uh, of LED light strands. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, uh, but uh, right, right there embedded in, in that uh, crop. So it's an exciting uh, type of uh, a variation of application for, for lighting in a, in a greenhouse. Uh, if we can add lighting, it allows you to extend the growing season and increase productivity. That's not always the case. Uh, in Connecticut, uh, our growers are typically just growing within the season that uh, natural light allows. Uh, again, kind of just uh, an overview. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, an emphasis on energy, uh, inc improved energy efficiency, uh, spatialization, uh, uh, we have glazing materials and, and coatings that retain heat and diffuse light. By diffusing light, uh, especially in the high light time of the year, you get better penetration within that vertical crop. You get much of the same type of response that I talked about with the LED lights embedded in the crop. So those lower leaves on the, on the uh, plant canopy are more productive as that light scatters. Uh, you don't get sharp shadows. Uh, not as great under very low light conditions in midwinter, but um, under uh, higher light conditions, say from Mar March to October, uh, could be some advantages there. Uh, the use of curtain systems for energy retention. We can also use curtain systems for shading to, uh, to uh, assist with temperature control. Uh, uh, there's some uh, interesting uh, technology coming out of Europe on uh, air exchange uh, to uh, modify the, the um, vapor pressure deficit or the uh, humidity condition in the vicinity of the crop to boost uh, gas exchange. And then uh, these systems uh, work in a closed greenhouse so we can uh, uh, bring in dry, uh, warm air uh, at the plant level and then take the moist air out of the top of the greenhouse uh, run it through a heat exchanger, and then uh, bring that back in, recover CO2, recover some of the energy. Uh, so very interesting technologies that are, that are uh, being developed in some of these more advanced uh, ranges. Uh, the center picture is a little bit of an experimental type of thing where they are looking at uh, troughs that can be raised and lowered so that as one crop transitions out of production, a new crop can be put in and get into production very quickly. So this is uh, some of the spatialization uh, research, not ready uh, for application yet, but, but uh, an interesting uh, uh, technology under development. Okay, uh, so uh, let, me, let me get into the main talk here. So uh, when we talk about production, uh, everything begins with light. So light is going to uh, drive the growth, the photosynthetic capacity of the crop. 
And there's a rule of thumb that we we use, and it applies uh, primarily during the light limited months of the year. But a one percent increase in light in photosynthetically active radiation uh, equals one percent increase in yield potential. I say yield potential because um, if we don't control the other aspects of the environment, the temperature, the humidity, uh, 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 nutrition, uh, watering uh, correctly, we won't realize that potential. But it, if we get more light into the crop, especially during these low light times of year, we can, we can increase yield. And the more light we get, the better our yields uh, can possibly be, as long as we can control the other aspects. So here you have basically two choices. One, you can add supplemental light to boost photosynthetic capacity and extend the production season. So we're talking about high pressure sodium or LED lighting systems to boost light during the low light times of the year. Uh, the other option is to just maximize the available light that nature gives you and manage around that. And that's usually what a lot of growers um, in this area are doing. So we grow within the season when we have uh, adequate natural light, and then we just try to optimize uh, the use of that light uh, by managing all these other environmental variables. So supplemental light uh, uh, can, uh, can dramatically increase yields during these light limited uh, months of the year. So uh, here's a little uh, just, uh, diagram demonstrating differences in photosynthetic light and the photosynthetic capacity of the crop. In a winter greenhouse up in our area, we're very much on the low end of this light curve. So any, any increase in light uh, during these low light times of the year is gonna have a direct positive impact on, on uh, yield potential and, and growth. And that's that 1% rule. When we get into the summer months, these uh, light is extremely high. We're typically worried about managing the other parts of the environment, the temperature, humidity, those, those type of things, uh, proper water and nutrition to match that light environment. Uh, but in these, a good part of the year uh, in this uh, northern climates, uh, we are in this low light time of year and, and increasing light or maximizing the available light is really the name of the game here. So uh, uh, I, I mentioned the LED lights embedded right in the plant uh, canopy. Now here's another uh, picture of it. And uh, what that does is when we put light overhead, uh, we increase the photosynthetic capacity, mainly in the top of the crop, the, uh, which is intercepting most of that light, it's closest to it. We still don't get great penetration deep down into that uh, vertical uh, canopy, so the lower leaves are not as productive as they can be. By embedding an LED light strand down there, we can increase the overall whole plant productivity. Uh, so rather than just the top leaves, we are boosting the overall productivity of the whole plant and uh, uh, greatly affecting uh, that yield capacity of the crop. Okay, so if you can't add light, then you're left with trying to adjust and manage, manage your greenhouse uh, to optimize the light that is available. And that's typically uh, what most growers are doing. So managing around what nature gives you. Uh, start by just maximizing that natural light, uh, keeping the glazing materials clean, minimizing shadows. These are pretty simple things, but they can make a big difference. A lot of dust on your greenhouse, uh, old or um, or yellowed, uh, uh, scarred up uh, glazing materials on the greenhouse can dramatically cut down on the amount of light that's going to penetrate into uh, the greenhouse. White reflective surfaces this is something I recommended for years, uh, and it makes a big difference. Uh, light comes into the greenhouse if it misses the leaves on the way down and it hits a reflective surface and bounce back up and then hits a leaf, the plant can make use of it. It doesn't matter if it's coming directly from uh, above or bouncing up from below. Uh, that plant's gonna be able to make use of it. If we have dark surfaces, 
they're going to absorb light. If we have light uh, reflective surfaces, uh, they'll reflect light. Uh, this one picture I have on the lower left-hand side is a, is a greenhouse in Holland. And you can see the structure itself, the piping, the, uh, the trusses and the vertical supports are all coated in a white reflective enamel. So really going all the way to try to maximize the available light that nature uh, is giving them. There's no uh, supplemental light in this greenhouse. So simply trying to maximize the available natural light by having as much as many uh, white reflective surfaces as possible. Uh, so uh, white plastics on the floor uh, to reflect light in your aisles uh, is, is, uh, is something that at a minimum uh, I would consider doing. Okay, uh, so how do we uh, adjust our, our management to maximize a yield in a light limited environment? There's a number of things we can do. Uh, uh, if it's a very low light time of year, we simply would not uh, try to grow. Uh, you're not going to get the productivity that's going to offset the cost of production. Uh, so working around what nature gives you as far as timing of the crop is, is a first step. Uh, we can reduce plant density, uh, give more area per plant so, uh, so that plant has the chance to harvest more of the light that does come into the greenhouse. Uh, reducing fruit load. Uh, don't let six fruit come on a cluster. If you can only support two fruit per cluster or three fruit per cluster, that's what you need to do to maintain the vigor of that crop and continuous production over time. So fruit pruning uh, to adjust to the um, uh, available light is, is uh, an important uh, management consideration. Uh, we can adjust temperatures, run cooler temperatures uh, uh, during the low light time of year. And I'll talk more extensively about that in a little bit. Uh, we would make adjustments to irrigation, make adjustments to fertility, uh, how we manage our, our overall electrical conductivity and uh, our uh, fertilizer management uh, program overall. And then maintaining an optimal humidity. We don't think about controlling this very much, but uh, if we have very wet air in the greenhouse, we're not going to have very good gas exchange. The leaves have a difficult time cooling themselves. Uh, they, uh, they're not taken in carbon dioxide. Uh, so we're not being as productive or using the, the light as efficiently as possible. If it's too, too dry, uh, we, have, uh, we can get water stress on the plant and, and wilting. And so uh, kind of having that that sweet spot of humidity in the greenhouse is, uh, uh, is an important factor as well. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, uh, we can use supplemental CO2. If you're adding light, supplemental CO2 usually makes some sense. Uh, at a very low light time of year, it uh, probably just maintaining atmospheric levels would be uh, the reasonable thing to do. But you can see on this graph in the middle, uh, the bottom line is 150 micromoles. That's very low light levels. Uh, adding CO2 above what nature gives us, which is around 415 parts per million right now, doesn't do us a whole lot of good. But if you start getting into higher light, you're getting 15 moles per day, which we might get at the end of March, say. Uh, and you add 600 to 1,000 parts per million uh, uh, CO2, you can dramatically increase the overall productivity. So typically when, uh, when growers are adding light, they'll add CO2 as well. Um, one other thing to consider in a greenhouse that's tightly sealed, if you're not exchanging air to the outside and the sun comes up, that carbon dioxide level in the greenhouse can drop below atmospheric levels and it can get uh, quite low to the point where it becomes limiting. So we would not want to have that. If we're not introducing CO2, we at least would want to exchange air, air periodically to make sure that we're maintaining adequate CO2 levels in the, uh, in the greenhouse. Uh, provide more space per plant in light limited months for tomato, uh, five to six 
feet per plant, don't jam them in there. Uh, uh, reflective surfaces, wide access aisles, uh, space between plants. Uh, we get into the light, high light time of year, we can have tighter, tighter spacing uh, on the tomato, four to five square foot per plant might be, might be an adequate way to go. Uh, you're not going to change your yield a whole lot. You'll just get more per plant with a lower spacing. Uh, you'll get bigger fruit. Uh, so the overall productivity uh, of the of the square footage of a greenhouse will not be uh, uh, disadvantaged by giving them more space, especially during those low light times of year. Okay, let's talk about temperatures. So uh, we want to match temperature to the prevailing light conditions in the greenhouse. Um, Process is is uh uh, is photosynthesis taking place and transport of carbohydrates throughout the plant. Uh, we have respiration going on. Uh, some of these uh, essential processes will fall off quite considerably at high temperatures or uh, low temperatures. Things like respiration continue to go up as temperature goes up. We can get into a situation where we're under low light if we're running too high a temperature for that time of year. When we're burning up most of our photosynthate uh, through respiration rather than having to go towards a growth or yield process. So there's a need to match this, uh, 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 the temperature that we're running in the greenhouse with, with that light environment. So, in a, in, and it's not a simple thing where we can say, well, in here's a low light season, this is midwinter. I'm showing you a graph which I'm uh, uh, looking at the actual light levels in a greenhouse. You can see on the best days there, the top of each of those high bars, uh, we're getting eight to 10 micro, 10, eight to 10 moles of light per day. Uh, that's not terribly high. That's a low light time of year. That would be hard to produce a good crop. We get around 15, we can start doing better. We get to 20, we're doing really, really good. That's a highlight uh, time, time of year in a greenhouse. But we have days in between when we're getting very low light. So even when we get into say March, when we might be getting 15 moles per day on a, on a, a, a cloudless day, uh, we may have a week where we get almost no light, uh, where a few days in a row where we get no light. So with temperature, there's both a seasonal adjustment we need to make to the prevailing overall light conditions of the season. And then there's also short-term adjustments that are important. So temperature is one of the things we need to manage both uh, on a seasonal basis and on a daily basis. So here are some of the adjustments that I would recommend. So uh, seasonally, we run cooler average, 24-hour average temperature. Uh, during the light limited season. We would be running cooler under those low light conditions than we would during high light conditions on a 24 hour average. But on a daily basis, we would adjust the night temperature to the light condition of the preceding day. What is happening in those plants is they harvest a certain amount of light, they fix a certain amount of carbon during the day. If it's a bright day, a relatively bright day for that time of year, we have a lot of photosynthate in the plant. That photosynthesis, uh, those carbohydrates are then transported throughout the plant overnight uh, to the various growing points, uh, the new leaves, the growing point, developing clusters of fruit. Uh, if we have a very low light day, we don't have much carbohydrate to distribute throughout the plant. If we run a high temperature at night, all we're doing is burning up a lot of that available carbohydrate, that very limited carbohydrate as, as respiration. So we're just respiration is kind of just maintaining the plant, but no real growth processes. So if we have a low light condition, a low light time of year, and then a very low light day, that night we want to run a few degrees cooler. So uh, here are some examples in tomato. During the light limited season, we would run uh, 
uh, cooler average daily temperatures than we would uh, in the brighter time of year. And then at night, we would run, say, 60 degrees following dark days or, say, 63 degrees following bright days. Not a big difference, but those few degrees will make will make a difference in in optimizing that yield. Uh, during the light abundance season, we would run uh, a warmer average daily temperature, 24 hour average. And then at night following a dark day, again, we would run a little cooler. And then at night following a bright day, we can run warmer. A few degrees makes a difference here. Okay, uh, we could do the same thing with other crops. If you're growing cucumbers, the average daily temperature, the, the optimal temperatures at night would be different, but it's the same principle. We're running uh, warmer following bright days and cooler following uh, dark, uh, dark days. Uh, here's a picture of a technology that's been around for a while where uh, heating tubes are actually being in, uh, suspended right inside the canopy. So these are uh, these are modifying the microenvironment within that uh, uh, developing uh, those developing fruit clusters. So by boosting that temperature of of those clusters uh, and those surrounding uh, leaves, we increase the metabolism of that part of the plant, that section of the vertical crop, uh, uh, preferentially. And so by increasing say temperature in that micro and climate climate at night uh, those developing clusters will pull in more of those carbohydrates they'll have a, a stronger pull pull to uh, draw in uh, carbohydrates that were fixed uh, during the day and to uh, uh, produce increased uh, yields uh, if we're suspending uh, LED lighting in there, uh, that's going to have some of the same same effect. We'll get a little bit of heat with that, and uh, obviously the photosynthetic uh, benefit. Okay, excessive heat can be a problem as well. So we get up on this part of the curve where uh, growth rate drastically falls off because temperature gets too high. Again, uh, photosynthetic efficiency is going is going down. Uh, uh, the metabol metabolism of the plant is adversely affected, and then radiation continues to go high, so we're just burning up everything that we have available, and our growth falls off. Um, we can use evaporative cooling uh, that has the potential to reduce air temperature down to the dew point. If we have very high humidity, it's not going to be very effective. If we have lower humidity, it can be uh, pretty effective. For tomatoes, if we're getting temperatures above 85, that's starting to get into a little bit of a stressful circumstance. If we get above 90, that's a bigger warning, and, and you're going to start seeing some more adverse effects. And then if we get above 95, we start seeing a lot of really uh, uh, difficult uh, circumstances, uh, poor fruit set, poor, poor pollen tube development. Uh, so the ideal temperatures would be to maintain something in those mid-80s at at, at worst and try not to drift up into the 90s. If we are getting higher than that, then we have to have a way of cooling down that house. So we can use evaporative cooling, either a, an evaporative cooling pad or a fog system in the greenhouse. Uh, other options would be to cut out some of the light during the time of year, uh, time of day that uh, that heat load is getting too high. So that comes down to uh, to shade systems. Uh, during the brightest part of the day, we can't control the temperature. We can cut out some of the light. So here's a reflective uh, 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 shade curtain where it has some silf silvery strips on it, allows air to move through it. it re it's reflecting uh, some of that light back out of the greenhouse uh, because we can handle the, uh, the load on that uh, plant. Uh, these deployable systems, a, a shade curtain system has a big advantage because you have some days where it's not sunny, some days where it's cloudy and you don't want the shade on the greenhouse. Um, uh, so we can, even on a bright day, we may want to have that open for the first three or four hours of the day, maximize uh, that photosynthetic process early in the day, 
Once it starts getting too hot, we can pull our shade to block out some of the light to maintain cooler temperatures. And then we can open it towards evening when we no longer have the heat load, but we still can take advantage of the light. If you can't, if you don't have the ability to have a deployable system like a shade curtain system in the greenhouse, uh, a semi-permanent shade scrim over the greenhouse or a shade compound in the summer months might be your best alternative. A 35% scrim swung, uh, slung over, say, a, a Quonset hut type greenhouse uh, cuts out 35% of the light uh, on days when you need it and days when you don't, but it's, it's, uh, it's better than uh, the adverse effects of very high temperatures if you can't control those in the greenhouse. Okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, managing humidity. So we don't think a whole lot about it, but humidity has a big impact on gas exchange and our photosynthetic capacity. So we're trying to optimize growth. There's gonna be certain ranges uh, that are gonna be important. We measure vapor pressure, uh, uh, vapor pressure deficit. That's the difference between the maximum amount of, of, uh, of water that the, uh, the air can hold at a given temperature and the amount of water actually in the air. So if we have very warm air, it can hold a lot of water. If it's cool air, it holds a lot less. And that can be pretty dramatic differences. Uh, you go from 60 degree air, uh, 65 uh, cubic meter might hold 10 grams of water. You get up to 105, it can hold 50 grams of water. So there's a big difference in the amount of water that the air can hold based on temperature. So vapor pressure deficit, or that difference between the actual amount of water in the air and the amount that it can possibly hold at a given temperature, uh, is going to affect the gas exchange out of our crop. Uh, I have some cartoons here. Uh, you can see if the difference between the water in the air and the actual water hull capacity is, is big. The plants can exchange water, transpire, cool them, to cool themselves to maintain internal temperatures that are, are, are desirable. Uh, it'll also cool the greenhouse. Uh, as water moves out of the leaves, carbon dioxide moves in. So uh, gas exchange is very important. If vapor pressure deficit is too low, that is the air is almost saturated with water, we don't have good gas exchange. There's gonna be, uh, uh, we're not gonna be able to have efficient photosynthetic processes. Uh, we can run into a, a number of adverse effects. Uh, if it's too high or too low, uh, we run into these problems. Uh, we can get water stress conditions. We can uh, have problems with nutrient movement from root to shoot because water's not moving. If it's very wet in the greenhouse or we have condensation forming at night, uh, we can get disease and that type of, uh, type of thing. So uh, horizontal airflow is important for gas exchange. It, it sweeps that wet air away from the leaf. Uh, it brings in fresh air uh, that uh, contains carbon dioxide. So we facilitate that gas exchange by moving air around the greenhouse. So um, horizontal airflow is something you, you should have uh, to optimize your, your house. This chart here is showing you the relationship between relative humidity and temperature. So on the uh, left-hand side, you'll see temperature degrees Fahrenheit going from 59 to 95. And then across the top, we have humidity uh, going from about 35% up to 100%. So, and in the chart, uh, these are vapor pressure deficit uh, uh, numbers. So we're looking at vapor pressure deficit here. And these numbers happen to be in units called millibars uh, the important thing here is the pink ones are showing you when the air is too wet. So here uh, you get to 100% humidity, 95% humidity. Uh, the plants are not exchanging gas uh, very efficient, efficiently. They can't uh, uh, evaporative cool to cool themselves down uh, or photosynthetic processes are breaking down. On the blue side, the dark blue on the right-hand side, um, that's when the air is too, too dry. Now the plants are gonna be wilting. They can't keep up with water demand. Again, photosynthetic capacity falls way off. 
the green would be an, an ideal zone and the white is an acceptable zone. The key thing I want to point out here is if you grow at say 68 or 70, take say 68, uh, there's a very wide range of humidities that are going to be appropriate for growing anywhere from about 50% relative humidity up to 80%. We get up to 95 degrees, that kind of safe zone for growing is very, very narrow. Uh, 90 to 80 percent humidity anything higher than that is too wet anything lower than that is going to be too stressful so keeping our uh, air exchange uh, uh, going so that we don't have too high or too low a, 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 a water vapor content in that air uh, is going to make growing a lot a lot easier and keeping the overall temperature of the house cooler is going to be more beneficial and give us more um, uh, a little more leeway in hitting a safe spot than if we're growing at very very high temperatures. So here's some of the relationships between uh, uh, energy coming in from the sun and then what happens with our various processes in the greenhouse. Uh, on the top line here, we're looking at uh, uh, a high light condition. Uh, the house heats up and we have high air temperature. Uh, that means the relative humidity goes down because the uh, water hold capacity of the air is greatly increasing. Vapor pressure deficit goes up. And as vapor pressure deficit goes up, our irrigation demand goes up. Evaporation off the leaf surface, gas exchange goes up as well. Now, this is okay as long as these are in safe zones. Uh, uh, we have two choices here. We can use evaporative cooling or a fog to try to cool the greenhouse, or we can just use ventilation to cool the greenhouse. They have different effects on vapor pressure deficit and our irrigation demand. If we use supplemental evaporative cooling or a fog system, it'll cool the house as long as the air is dry enough uh, or humidity is not too, too high. Our relative humidity will go up. Now, if this was a circumstance where we were on that blue side of the vapor pressure deficit, that is the air was too dry, this would be an ideal solution. Uh, so our, vape, our relative humidity would go up, vapor pressure deficit would go down, it would go into a safe zone, irrigation demand would go down, evaporative cooling would, would go down, but they, if, as long as they're in a safe uh, uh, region, we would be okay. If we pull in, pull in cool, cooler air, uh, dry air from the outside, that's another way to cool, so just ventilation, whether natural ventilation or active ventilation, um, that will cool the air. Uh, relative humidity will go down. We're bringing in dry, uh, cool air and it's heating up in the greenhouse. Vapor pressure deficit goes up, uh, irrigation demand goes up, and evaporative uh, evaporative trans evapotranspiration or gas exchange go up. So if we're in a situation where the, the air in the greenhouse is too wet, we're in that pink zone at very high humidity, this is the solution to that, to bring in cooler, dry air. So we have a couple tools that we can use to, to control that uh, humidity in a safe zone. If we get to the evening hours and we have very wet air, and uh, that greenhouse cools down, we'll get condensation forming in the greenhouse. And that uh, can be a real problem at night with, uh, with disease. So I showed you a little bit of this in the beginning. This is the air energy system that uh, some of the uh, European greenhouses are starting to use. And the purpose of this is to pull out that humid air from the greenhouse, uh, exchange it, uh, uh, run it through a heat exchange or a heat exchanger outside where the inside wet air is cooled down. Uh, the water falls out, it condenses and comes out of the air. And that same air with containing some of the energy from inside the greenhouse and some of the CO2 inside the greenhouse is introduced back into the greenhouse as drier air uh, at plant level. So we're maintaining an adequate or proper uh, vapor pressure deficit right in the vicinity of, of the leaves. Uh, and then as that air heats and takes on more moisture, it rises in the greenhouse. And again, is swept out of the top of the greenhouse and goes through the heat exchanger. So they're recovering some of the uh, energy that's in that inside air. They're recovering some of the CO2 and they're, 
and they're maintaining an adequate uh, uh, vapor pressure deficit inside the greenhouse. Okay, uh, matching fruit load to the carrying capacity of the plant. This is one thing we can typically do. Uh, we can do some pruning. So if the plant's uh, too vegetative, we can prune leaves. If the plant is too, uh, is too burdened with fruit where we're getting a lot of small fruit and the vegetative growth falls way off, we can prune the cluster back so we have fewer fruit on a cluster to maintain size and to maintain the vigor of the crop overall. Uh, everything here starts with pollination. If we don't get good pollination, we are not going to get good fruit size and good yields. Um, uh, there's a very strong correlation, about 95% correlation between the number of seeds in a fruit and the size potential of that fruit. So if we get good, each seed represents a pollen grain. If we get good pollination, we get a lot of seeds in those fruit, those fruit, uh, are going to be pulling in those carbohydrates very strongly and and have the potential to uh, get good size if we don't get good pollination uh there's not much hope of getting uh, good yields uh here uh but we can we can prune the clusters we can prune off fruit to maintain fruit load and and fruit size uh, how many in the winter time if very low light uh if you're going through the worst months of the year maybe two fruit per cluster uh, three to four other times of the year uh, you get into highlight times in the summer you can get five fruit on a cluster uh, pretty safely if you're you know those those little fruit at the end uh weight in those and we prune them off goes towards the other fruit uh in that cluster so we don't lose much on yield we just get better size by uh, doing a little bit of pruning on these the plants are too vegetative we can pr prune off some of the leaves or half of leaves uh, to allow the plants to uh, carry uh, more fruit Okay, uh, grafted rootstock uh, is something that was introduced quite a few years ago. Uh, a lot of growers are doing it. Uh, this has the potential to greatly increase the vigor of the plant. And it, it gives us much more yield potential. Uh, a lot of these rootstocks come with specific disease resistance. Uh, so if you're growing in the ground, for instance, or even not growing in the ground, uh, but subject to some uh, root rot type diseases, uh, some of these uh, root stocks can be very useful to use. There's a really good website here, uh, this vegetable grafting, uh, uh, grafting.org. You go there, you'll get a list of, of suppliers, the specific root stocks, and what some of the characteristics of those root stocks are, uh, whether they convey increased vigor or specific disease resistance. Uh, but rootstocks uh, really increase our yield potential, especially if you're growing a, uh, a single plant to two vines in the greenhouse and want to have an optimal load on those, uh, fruit load on those, you're going to want a vigorous uh, rootstock. Okay, uh, irrigation, uh, we try to match the carrying capacity uh, of, of, of the plant and the prevailing environmental conditions. Um, so uh, irrigation, if uh, we just put this this all up. So uh, irrigation is something we adjust on a daily basis. So some days are bright and warm, and the plants, and we're moving a lot of air through the greenhouse. So irrigation demand goes up. Uh, some days are are not warm or bright, and or irrigation uh, goes down. So irrigation very much is a daily adjustment. Fertility is based on season and stage of development. We can't make those type of fine adjustments on a uh, that quick a basis, especially if we're growing, say, in an artificial media or in, in the soil or something like that. Uh, it, so we're we're making these adjustments different, uh, whether we're talking about irrigation or fertility. So as light and temperature increase, water uptake is is also going to increase. Uh, irrigation frequency should increase. Um, we get into the high light times of the year, nutrient solution concentrations, we typically run lower. So we decrease the concentration in the bright months, and then we increase it in the, the darker months of the year. So running a higher EC in the darker months. In hot weather, bright weather, we're bringing a lot of water up through that plant. So those plants are getting plenty of nutrients up into the upper part of the plant from the roots, even with a lower EC. Uh, 
because they're just moving a whole lot more. And the biggest uh, 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 concern here would be water stress on the plant. If we have salt levels that are too high in the root zone and they can't keep up with water demand under hot weather conditions, that can be an issue. Uh, and uh, just to mention, we should monitor nutrition and water status on a regular basis, uh, uh, especially if you're a relatively new grower, uh, running a nutrient uh, test on your crop periodically will give you some experience with where they should be and how to, how to match what you're actually getting in those readings, when, how the crop is performing. Okay, so both uh, water and fertility, um, uh, we can use those to control the uh, growth and the tendency towards either vegetative or reproductive growth uh, and development. So there's a real balancing act here with irrigation. Uh, if we increase water stress, we're going to push the plant towards reproductive growth. If, 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 it's, uh, if that uh, water is too luxurious, we'll favor vegetative growth. So there's some balance and act here. Uh, rule of thumb for irrigation that I use is uh, for vegetative growth, if uh, we're growing, say, a peat light uh, material and we water, uh, that, uh, we water that material, we would look for, say, an 8 to 10 percent dry down before the next irrigation. Uh, that would favor vegetative growth if we're in a reproductive mode uh, producing fruit a bigger dry down is appropriate, 17%. We start getting uh, too, too, uh, too much fruit and our vegetative growth falls way off. We can be a little more generous with the irrigation to boost that, uh, that vegetative response at the plant. So we're trying to balance the vegetative response, the continued production, continued growth of new leaves, uh, of a healthy, a healthy stem, new flowers with, uh, with the yield of the uh, crop. So we can do that to some degree with uh, irrigation. Um, water stress would be uh, adjusted throughout the day, typically early in the morning when the plant's coming out of the night conditions, it sees the first light of the day. We have a very big potential for, uh, for photosynthetic capacity and growth. So we want to uh, reduce stress here. So we would go wetter early in the day. As you get towards evening, you want it to ride through the night in a, a drier uh, condition. Uh, so we would let it dry down more uh, to prevent any kind of disease type issues, any type of, uh, of buildup of, uh, of glutation or water on the leaves, that type of thing. Uh, so we would adjust water frequency to the weather conditions and to the plant size. So again, if, if, it's, a, if it's a a cloudy day, we're not going to be watering as frequently or as much as if it's a, a bright, a dry day. Uh, typically, frequent light uh, irrigation cycles work better than, say, coming in and water once a day and then come back and do it again the next morning. Uh, so typically, uh, f more frequent light irrigations give you a little better control over the crop. And then if we go too far in either extreme, we can run into a number of adverse uh, effects, either, either with chronic overwatering or chronic, chronic uh, underwatering. Uh, things like cracking and stuff uh, can be impacted. Okay, uh, fertility, uh, we can't make those type of adjustments on a daily basis, so we're managing fertility uh, to the stage of plant development and the seasonal conditions that we're under. Um, uh, prior to first flower, the things we try to manage would be potassium to nitrogen ratio. We have a complete fertilizer solution. Um, so, uh, potassium to nitrogen ratio, when those are about one to one, that favors vegetative plant development. Uh, we go, we start getting into the first to the fourth cluster set. We would run higher potassium to nitrogen, 1.5 to one. As uh, fruit are beginning to ripen and mature, we can run that ratio even higher, 1.7 to one. If at any point the plant is becoming uh, too too constricted in its growth, uh, new leaves are not developing properly, this, the top of the plant is getting very thin, uh, we have too much uh, fruit load on that plant, we can boost vegetative growth at any time by increasing the nitrogen, moving 
back down towards that one to one for a couple of weeks to boost some uh, vegetative uh, growth. And if we increase the nitrogen that comes from an ammonium source, that will especially uh, uh, increase that vegetative growth. Now, we don't want to do that for too long or too high because that can have a lot of adverse effects. Uh, but that would be a short term adjustment for a few weeks to try to, uh, to try to boost that vegetative growth. As we move that potassium to nitrogen ratio closer to one to one, we would also be increasing calcium and magnesium. So that would boost some vegetative development. Um, the form of nitrogen I alluded to. So typically we want to keep our ammonium form nitrogen to less than 10% of the total. So most of the nitrogen is coming from nitrate rather than ammonium form nitrogen. Uh, we get too much high ammonium form nitrogen. We have a lot of adverse effects on the plant. The plant can be too vegetative. We can get conditions like blossom end rot. Uh, so these are things we want to avoid. We can get above that 10%, uh, maybe 15% for a very short duration and not have an adverse effect. But typically we're trying to, especially we're trying to boost a vegetative growth that can be very effective. Uh, but uh, typically we're trying to keep that below the 10%. The picture I have here is a, a photograph from a grower out on Cape Cod many years ago. And you can see these plants are about head high, uh, extremely uh, dense uh, vegetative growth. The stems were about an inch thick at the top. The leaves were tightly curled down. Uh, tremendous vegetative growth, not a single fruit in the house uh, because uh, they were using a, a very uh, poor nutritional ratio, very high ammonium for nitrogen, very high nitrogen. So uh, going to the extreme where they're getting tremendous vegetative development of the crop, but no fruit. So uh, we can use these tools to, to strike that proper balance, but we don't want to get in this uh, direction uh, too much. So a total fertility, you see now in the root zone, uh, I mentioned those already, uh, we can provide a little bit of stress uh, with that and alter this vegetative reproductive response as well. Uh, so typically, we change this fertility level with the season. Not can't do it on a daily basis. It's a, it's a seasonal thing. Uh, when we are in the lower light times of the year, something in the 2.5 to 3.5 range in the Northeast here is an appropriate range to be in. Uh, if we get higher than that, uh, uh, our fruit size will go down. Uh, the, old, the flavor will go up, and there's a balance here that we need to strike. Uh, keeping quality goes up, but our yields will go down. If we get too low in EC, uh, we'll tend to get a bigger fruit, but they will have a poor flavor. Poor flavor. Uh, the um, uh, uh, they'll be softer. They won't have the shelf life. Uh, so we tend to want to be in this range. We get into the summer months, we're running a lower EC. The plants are under some water stress. They need to pull up a lot of water. Uh, and so a lower salt level, because they're pulling up a lot more water on a daily basis, uh, plenty of nutrients are getting up into the top of the plant. We can go with a lower EC. Okay, uh, just to kind of close out. So experience is gonna be the most important thing of all. Uh, if you're new to this, you need to be able to read the plant to some degree to know what's going on, to monitor uh, uh, these various environmental parameters, the, the uh, water and the nutrition as well. Uh, we want The point is we want to be able to identify when we're going off track a little bit early so that we can make a proper adjustment. If you can detect when you're going off track early, the adjustment will be relatively minor to get back on track. If you're getting to the point where your yield totally stops, the plant uh, stops growing, uh, it's gonna take a lot more effort to get back on track. So being able to read the plant, whether it's it's, it's happy or not, is, is gonna be an important uh, factor. Uh, here's some things you can look for. So uh, if the leaves are bright, uh, they are under low water stress. When they get duller, you're under a moderate water stress. If you're wilting, you certainly got an issue. Uh, the newly developing stem at the top of the plant, 
Typically, we look for something about a half inch thick, six inches down from the top of the plant. If it's thicker, like those ones I showed you on Cape Cod, you're getting an inch, inch and a half thick with tightly curled down leaves. It's too vegetative. If it's thinner, it's probably too much stress on the plant. You might be carrying too many fruit for that plant at that time of year. Uh, leaves should be closely spaced, expand rapidly and develop uh, a, a deep green in color. And then the fruit and flowers should uh, flowers should develop and 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 pollinate, and fruit should develop easily. If you're aborting a lot of flowers, uh, the fruit are not coming out properly. A lot of poor pollination. You're obviously off track, and you need to make some adjustments.